Hello, my name is George Nacek. Earlier today I had a discussion with a, a few flat earthers, one by the name of uh, Nummy Num and uh, Eric. And these two gentlemen are two of the more reasonable flat earthers that I've ever come across. Um, they seem uh, curious, uh, particularly uh, Nummy. Uh, we had some discussions the last couple days and uh, he really seemed to be open to uh, discussions and really wanted to learn. Uh, I was uh, really quite pleased to see that he followed up on some uh, information that I gave him yesterday, unlike a lot of uh, flat earthers that just uh, don't bother to look into uh, um, issues any further because of their uh, dogmatic... Um, uh, convictions, but uh, this Nummy really does seem to be open to uh, new ideas and um, uh, alternative explanations for things. Well, in the discussion today, um, the subject of Brian Mullins' Force the Line experiment came up. And Nummy is the first flat earther that has ever asked me about my opinion of it. And I told him that I thought it was quite unworkable the way it was proposed, but I had a way to salvage it and improve upon it. So this is for you, Nummy. I um, will go through my thoughts on where the cumbersome issues are in Mullins. Uh, force the line experiment and how you could go about improving upon it and uh, if somebody uh, would like to uh, set this thing up and maybe uh, uh, ask for my help on engineering in this I'd be more than happy to help you but let's just go through what this force the line experiment is you can look it up um, I, I, there's many videos out there um, that cover uh, Brian Mullins' discussion of this Force the Line. But basically, what the um, experiment is, is to establish a straight rail system, a fence system that's straight over distance, so that you can compare the rails to the surface of the earth to see if over distance the earth is falling away from the uh, straight line of the rail or if the rail remains a constant distance above the earth. Well, to do this properly, as um, Mullen recognized, you need to compare it with the surface of water. So you're going to have to dig a channel or a canal and have it filled with water because water seeks a natural level that's equal and parallel to a gravitational equal potential. So whether the flat is, uh, or, or the earth is flat, or has a curved contour, the water will form itself and follow that contour. So suppose you have, say, a canal of water, and along the side of this canal, you build this rail system. You have, say, posts every 10 feet, and then you mount metal rails on this and you have to butt them up against one another and you continue this on for miles. Well, there's many problems with this having to do with machining tolerances and how to ensure that you're actually mounting these things so that they are perfectly straight. Well, the idea here is you have this canal of water and over miles of distance, if the earth is flat, then the distance from the top surface of the rail to the surface of the water in the canal will remain constant over distance if the earth is flat. If the earth is curved, then these drop distances will increase as you go away from the starting point as you move out, these drop distances will increase and you could measure those drop distances and see how it compares with the standard eight inches per mile squared or some other thing. 
So that in a nutshell is what Brian Mullen has uh, proposed, but um, I'll now go through and show uh, why the tolerances on doing something this are ridiculously stringent and it, you need to come up with maybe uh, a different method other than this rail system to ensure that you're not going to uh, fail in the endeavor here. It'd be a shame spending all this money and then finding that it's just impossible to get these things lined up properly in order to uh, do these comparisons to see if the earth surface is flat or curved. Now let's look at some of the tolerance issues and why there's going to be extreme difficulty in lining the rails up in this force the line uh, fence that uh, was conceived by uh, Brian Mullen and uh, why I feel this implementation is just basically impossible to implement. Now if the earth is curved, has a curved contour, and let's say <clears throat> we're lining up our rails, these rails have a length L and let's just look at what happens when we're trying to line two rails up. Now <clears throat> if the rails were to be lined such that their centers are just touching the contour of this curved earth, what kind of tolerances would there be needed to straighten, straighten these out so that the two rails are just butted up against one another and they form a straight line that this rail would be uh, rotated upward to go in a straight line with this rail. Let's just see what kind of tolerances we're going to need in order to accomplish that. Now the rails are sitting with their middles just touching the contour of the earth. So this is L over 2, this is L over 2, so from midpoint to midpoint is L. Now, with the current understanding of the spherical Earth, we know the distance from the surface down to the center is the radius of the Earth, RE, we'll call it. And that distance is 6,371 kilometers from the surface to the center. <clears throat> now, if we have the rails where they're just touching on the bottom here, there's going to be a gap at the top here between the two ends. <clears throat> we'll call this little g. And that I'm representing in this blow up here. The uh, thickness of the rail is tau. That's this distance here. The angle that the two ends make where they're touching on the bottom and uh, separated by this gap G, that angle in here with this little triangle is theta. <clears throat> now the gap distance is related to the thickness and the angle of uh, separation here between the two ends by theta where theta is in radians so the gap distance is theta times the tau, the, the thickness tau. It's You just swing the radial arm a angle theta and that sweeps out this gap G. <clears throat> now let's get some relationships here so we can calculate what these errors might be. Here is uh, a, uh, uh, a zoomed out view of what we have here. These points go down to the center of the earth. Here's the surface. Here's the center of the earth. The distance from the center to the surface, this length is the radius of the earth, RE. Then 
<clears throat> these two points are here, separated by the arc length distance L. So the angle theta and L and RE are related, just like we have here, that this distance swept out is just the radial length through the angle theta, or L over RE is equal to theta. Or writing this the other way, L is equal to RE times theta, just bringing the RE over on the left-hand um, side here, or and uh, rearranging the equation, we can see that um, the relationship, the arc length swept out, is just the radial arm RE swept through an angle theta, just like we had here. G is angle theta swept out by the, the uh, arm here, which it happens to be the thickness of these rail members. This is the rail member thickness, tau. <clears throat> now, let's, let's look and see how these are all related. Now, these rail members, the ends are going to be machined, so this end will be parallel to a perpendicular line going through the midpoint. So this line and this line are parallel. And the same thing here, this end will be parallel to the perpendicular going through the middle. So this line and this line are parallel. So that is parallel to that. This line is parallel to that line. That's what I'm showing here. This line is parallel to that line. This line is parallel to that line. That being the case, we can see that the angle formed by these two outer lines, which is theta, also has to be the angle in here. So the angle in this gap is going to be exactly equal to the angle that the line from the surface of the earth goes, makes to the center of the earth and back to the midpoint of uh, this rail. So we're going from the midpoint of the rail. This is midpoint here, midpoint here. So that's what these are. This is a midpoint. This is a midpoint. So going from midpoint to the center, back up to the midpoint on the other rail, sweeps out an angle theta. That's going to be the same angle here that the two ends make because the ends are parallel to the perpendicular line going to the center of the earth at the midpoints. So I'm showing that here that the angle in this gap is theta which is the same as this theta here. we just proven that. Now, I can solve for theta, like I have there, and substitute it in here to get a relationship between the radius of the Earth, the um, uh, length of the rail member, and the thickness. Just substituting in theta, we get G is equal to L over radius of the Earth times the thickness of the rail member. <clears throat> so, this is the relationship. Now, we could put some numbers in. Let's assume that our rail length is 4.88 meters, which is 16.01 feet. So let's say the length of our rail members are around 16 feet, which is 4.88 meters. <clears throat> the thickness of the rail member, let's make those 10 centimeters, which is about 4 inches. It's just slightly under 4 inches. This is 3.94 inches. Um, a little bit thicker than a normal 2x4. Normal 2x4 is about 3.5 inches, so this would be like a rough cut 2x4 at about 4 inches thickness. So this towel is about 4 inches thick. And then of course we have the radius of the earth. Putting in the numbers, L is 0.1 meters, that's 10 centimeters. Our uh, that, that's our tall, I'm sorry, that's our tall. Our L is 4.88 meters, 
and we divide by 6371 times 10 to the third meters. Well, that works out to G comes out in meters. This is in meters. <clears throat> so our G works out to 76.6 nanometers. Okay, that's 10 to the minus 9th meters. That's less than the wavelength of light, green light. The wavelength of green light that we see is 532 nanometers. So this is less than uh, a wavelength of green light by a factor of uh, uh, 7. So it's seven times smaller than the wavelength of green light. Extremely small. Or we could put this in terms of angstroms. This is 766 angstroms. An angstrom is 10 to the minus 10th meters. This is basically the diameter of one atom. So we're talking that the tolerance on the gap here has to be better than 766 atoms across. You're never going to get this sort of thing machined. It would, the, the precision with which you have to do that is extraordinary. It would be extremely expensive in order to get that sort of a right angle cut on the end of a metal beam four inches thick across you're talking in order to get a precise right angle here that your tolerances you have to be better than about 766 atoms uh, across. It's just extraordinary. Um, uh, it, 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 you're, you're just never going to do it cost effectively if even you could do it for you know thousands of these things that you're trying to line up. Um, where if these are uh, 16 feet long, uh, you need a hundred of them to basically go about a quarter mile. So to go just one mile, you're going to need about 400 of these things machined to this sort of a tolerance. It's it's just uh, ridiculous to even think that you could do that. Now, let's look <clears throat> at uh, the type of errors that we're going to be looking for uh, on misalignment. You know, you're never going to get these things butted up to one another where you're going to have a perfectly straight line. You need to exercise care. For example, on these rails, you've got one rail and then you've got another rail and you're trying to establish a straight line over several miles of these rails. Well, if these are off just a little bit, you'll have accumulated error and these rails will not be in a straight line. Now we need to look at what kind of errors we might be able to tolerate, how much misalignment we can have. If we had a misalignment of 766 atoms width in the gap here, then the rails would be following a curved earth. They would not be straight. They'd just be following a curved earth. So we've, we're going to have to have tolerances much better than this in order to maintain a straight line with these rails stacked end to end. Now let's look at an acceptable tolerance and how uh, we can uh, work around it with uh, the proposal that I have for correcting all this and coming up with a cost-effective method for constructing a force the line type structure that you could compare uh, with the earth to see whether or not it's flat or the contour is curved. Like I mentioned before, in any experiment that you set up, you're going to have to accommodate the possibility that the contour of the earth is either flat or curved uh, at the standard model that's uh, given for a earth 
that has a radius of uh, 6,371 kilometers. The curve of the Earth on a sphere would be falling away at 8 inches per mile squared with a sphere that size. Now, suppose this is the contour surface of the Earth here. Now, we have a possibility of two surfaces. One is that it's flat as you go out from an observer, or it's curved as you go out from the observer. Now, <clears throat> what I'm going to be proposing is that we use an auto level for sighting. And what a surveyor's auto level, these are two surveyor auto levels that I have. This one is a Topcon ATB3. And this one here is a Topcon ATG2. This particular auto level has a spotting scope of 28 power. This one has a 32 power. I'd be proposing that we use an auto level with a 32 power scope. I'll show you how these auto levels work in the uh, uh, next bit here. But let's first go over these errors. Now, I have an auto level that I'm going to be citing a tangent. The sole purpose of an auto level in life is to cite tangents. It doesn't measure angles. It doesn't measure distances. It just cites a tangent from a spot of observation. So we set the auto level up at a point of observation here on the Earth and we shoot a tangent from that point of observation out. That's the blue line. We're, we're just shooting a straight tangent line. Now, the distance from the center of the optics of the auto level to the surface of the Earth we'll call D0. Now, if the Earth is flat, then this will be distance D0. We'll have the same distance from the tangent down to the surface of the Earth. And if the Earth is curved, we'll have an additional drop distance from that tangent line down to the surface in addition to D0. We'll have D0 plus D, which gives us a drop distance of D1. So if flat, D1 is going to equal D0 because D will be equal to 0. There will be no drop, additional drop due to a curvature if the Earth is flat. But if the Earth is curved, then D1 is going to be greater than D0. And D1 is going to be equal to D0 plus this additional amount. This additional amount given for the size of the Earth, the standard size of the Earth, where the radius of the Earth is 6,371 kilometers. This works out to 8 inches per mile squared, or 8 inches times x squared, where x is given in miles. So, on the chart here, so in the first mile, if x is 1 mile, we pick up 8 inches. That's our d. If x is 2 miles, we have 2 squared, or 4 times 8, which is 32 inches. If x is 3 miles out, we have 3 squared, or 9 times 8, or 72 inches, 6 feet. And so on, as we go down to 6 miles, 6 miles works out to 288 inches, or 24 feet. So, if the Earth is curved in a sphere, as proposed by the ball Earth model, then out at 6 miles, this additional drop will be 24 feet. In the first mile, it's 8 inches, and in the second mile, this is 32 inches. Now, what kind of error are we going to accept? Well, with the auto level, we, it never sets a precise tangent, but it can be pretty damn close depending upon how good the optics and the internal compensator is of that auto level. These auto levels I just showed you, my auto level has uh, the, the Topcon ATB3. I can get it within five arc seconds of error. 
and on the G2 we can get about three arc seconds of error. Now, suppose we're going to accept an error of in our drop measurement of one inch in a mile. For an error of one inch in a mile on the first mile where we're trying to discern whether or not we have an eight inch drop that works out to a twelve and a half percent error. Out at two miles we pick up two inches of error because it's linear with an odd level in sighting. We pick up two inches of error which works out two inches out of thirty two inches 6.25 percent and so on. At three miles we have 4.2, at four miles 3.152 percent and so on out to six miles where we have just a little over two percent error. The error goes as twelve and a half percent divided by the number of miles that we're shooting out for the linear amount of error. So at six miles when x is six 6 into 12 and a half is 6.08 as I show here. So now how accurate does our auto level have to be to pick up no more than one inch per mile? Well that works out to an auto level with an accuracy of 3.3 arc seconds. An auto level that has an accuracy of 3.3 arc seconds works out to an angular deviation or an angular error of 0 0.917 milladegrees or 0.917 one thousandth of a degree which is 16.0 microradians in radian measure. And this will give you an error of 1.01 .01 inches per mile. So basically one inch per mile. An auto level with 3.3 arc second angular accuracy will give you no more than one inch of error per mile in a height measurement out at a mile. So out at two miles you'll have no more than two inches in height deviation. Uh, uh, with that auto level with this kind of an accuracy. And this is easy to do. Uh, uh, auto levels with this type of accuracy are easy to come by. Uh, there are auto levels that go down to eight tenths of an arc second that I've found. Uh, so this is well within uh, reason in terms of uh, finding and purchasing an auto level that can give you that. I have an auto level that will do that. Now, why would, would we want to use the auto level? Well, a laser, a lot of people think a laser uh, would, uh, uh, you could use a laser for sighting this sort of a distance. I went through this in one of my um, updates on uh, my survey over the lake, but I'll just briefly go over that right now with a laser that has um, uh, a beam deviation. All lasers have beam deviation or divergence which will uh, cause the laser light, the beam of the light to spread out as it uh, goes out in the distance from the laser itself. The beams never remain pencil thin. People think that they do but they don't. If you have a laser, the beam on the laser will spread out over distance. And the way we rate this is this angular measure, call it alpha, and that's measured in milliradians. A typical laser will have about one milliradian of angular divergence. You can use collimating lenses to get it maybe a factor of 10 better, but that's very difficult. You're not going to get much better than a tenth of a milliradian for even the most expensive uh, uh, lasers and collimating lenses that you can find. Well, what does that give us? Well, 
let's say we have our laser with a collimating lens that's going to give us an alpha of a tenth of a milliradian. This is 10 to the minus 4th radians. Well, using the um, <clears throat> uh, relationship that we have, that if we say shooting a distance S out from the laser, how much of uh, deviation, angular, given this angular deviation of 10 to the minus 4th radians, or a ten thousandth of a radian, how much height deviation or how much is the beam diameter out at a distance s? Well, that relationship, the beam diameter, let's call it B diameter, that is equal to alpha s. Well, in this case, our alpha is 10 to the minus fourth times the distance s. Well, let's look at the first mile. The first mile is 5,280 feet. So one mile is 5,280 feet, and we multiply that by our alpha, or 10 to the minus fourth, that gives us 0.528 feet, about six inches, a little over six inches. That's unacceptable. With the auto level, we can get one inch, um, within one inch of accuracy. The beam spot size of a laser one mile out with a tenth of a um, milliradian beam divergence is going to have a spot size of six inches, and that's going to keep growing. By the time you get out to six miles, you're going to be three feet across with that beam of the laser you can't accurately locate the center of that beam um, when you have that type of uh, deviation. If you ever look at um, a laser spot several miles out, you can, you can see the spot from the source of the laser, but when you're at the end of the spot, that intensity is so small that you cannot find the edges of that spot. Um, it's just basically impossible to find where the edges are so that you could locate where the center of the spot is. So a laser is out of the question in terms of trying to get these types of accuracies. An auto level is a much better choice. In fact, by the time um, you look at what type of beam divergence you'd need to give the same accuracy precision as you get from an auto level of 0.33 arc seconds, the auto level is 63 times more precise than a, uh, a laser with one milliradian uh, beam divergence or better than six, a factor of six, than a laser with a beam divergence of a tenth of a milliradian. So, the auto level is a much better choice. It's much cheaper, much more accurate than trying to use a laser. Now, I'll talk about how we can fix this all up uh, with the method that I have conceived to replace this uh, uh, fence of rails that uh, Brian Mullen had envisioned. Uh, show you a much cheaper way to do it in a much more accurate way of setting it up than trying to line up all these rails butted up against one another. Now, what I'm proposing is that to align the um, structure to establish a straight tangent, a straight line tangent, is that we use a surveying auto level. Inside the auto level, there's a, what's called an internal compensator. If I jiggle, you can hear the internal compensator. Moving in these. Now the way these auto levels work is they have optics where the um, 
you have a spotting scope. Uh, all levels come in 20, 24, 28, 32 power spotting scopes. I propose we use a 32x spotting scope auto level. This would be like the Topcon ATG2. There are other manufacturers, but this is the one that I have that I use. And the compensator inside an auto level works on a plumb bob. The plumb bob is, you have a weight on a structure that moves some optics inside. Once you get the auto level, the bubble within uh, uh, about a degree, the compensator releases and then it establishes a tangent perpendicular to the gravitational field of the earth which in for a spherical earth would be pointing down to the center of the earth if you have a flat plain earth it would just always be perpendicular down so once the auto level compensator releases you are guaranteed that the crosshairs when you're looking through the auto level you have a horizontal crosshair and a vertical crosshair and some other uh, marks but this horizontal crosshair floats it doesn't matter how you tilt the auto level this will stay fixed at a tangent to the earth at the point of mounting so once the compensator is free to move these optics remain stable and constant and always sighting a tangent out from this point of where it's um, mounted now if the earth is curved you don't want to be moving the auto level because once you establish a mounting point if the auto level say is mounted here it's going to shoot a tangent out but if you move the auto level forward to some other place on the earth it's going to reestablish a new tangent at this point of where it's mounted because of the compensator the compensator remember always points to the center of the earth or to the center of gravity so it will shoot a new tangent line so you can't be moving your auto level forward uh, to sight out for a tangent because the tangents won't line up they won't be the same tangent so you have to keep your auto level back at your starting point of where you're shooting because if you kept moving it forward again every time you move it it establishes a new tangent line to the surface of the earth because this compensator is always pointing down towards the center of the earth or to the center of gravity so you can't move, be moving the auto level it has to stay at the beginning of where you're shooting your tangent line out so what we do then <clears throat> is rather than using rails what I propose is that we use pipes and a very cheap pipe to be using is DWV pipe sewer pipe DWV stands for drain waste venting and it's a cheap PVC pipe they generally come either in green color or white color this is a section of DWV pipe it's got a flared end where another pipe can fit in and lock in they come in 10 foot sections and they run about eight dollars a piece eight dollars thirty cents for a 10 foot section of this type of pipe this is a cheaper pipe cheaper PVC than your schedule 40 or your schedule 80 because these are not rated for holding pressure like a schedule 40 is which is a thicker tougher plastic now this is four inches in diameter they come in 10 foot lengths and the reason we would use this is what we do rather than using rails we use pipe and back at the end of the pipe where we're starting we set up our auto level we have it mounted here we have some structure 
you know, mounting structure. We can get into that in a bit, how to do that. To hold the pipe, we're going to have all these mounting structures to hold the pipe. And then we have our next pipe section here. And then another pipe section and so on going out. Now, how do we keep these in line? Well, we build a shed or a tent here to hold out the light. So it's dark inside here. And... We shoot the auto level at the center. We have it mounted at the center and we can move the pipe left or right, up and down. And what we can do is at the ends of these pipes have, there's caps you can get to put on here. You could open up the pat, uh, cut a hole in the uh, cap and put some crosshairs on to locate the center. So you put the cap on and you shoot, look through the auto level to line up the crosshairs of the auto level with the crosshairs in the end cap so that as you move the pipe so that you get the crosshairs of the pipe lined up with the crosshairs of the auto level then you know the pipe is level and you follow the same procedure then you lock it in place you, you add the next section you move the cap over here and look at it and move the pipe around so that the outer level is sighting the center of that pipe and so on and by doing this you don't need to use a laser it's much more accurate uh, by having dark you know a dark tent around you you're just getting the light from the end of the pipe so even if you're out say six miles if you get the pipe lined up each section lined up properly you you're going to be within four inches of, uh, even if you're off by the whole diameter of the pipe or radius of the pipe, your deviation is going to be more, no more than four inches most. And at four miles, that would give you your one inch uh, error. And you can do better than that as you um, move the pipe because as you look down a pipe, you will see light at the end of the pipe. If, the uh, pipes are lined up all properly. You'll, you'll see uh, light at the end of the pipe. And you can also check these uh, a number of sections if you wanted to by using a mason's line. Um, I use these mason lines. These things are incredible. This particular mason line has a tensile strength of about 70 uh, by 79, 80 pounds, somewhere in there is what I measured it, and it stretches out, and uh, it establishes an incredibly straight line, and you could do that, say, for uh, 100 feet or so, and not have any significant sag in the line over that distance to uh, check your alignment. And if you wanted to, you could shoot a laser down there, too, if you wanted to, but again, the laser beam of course, uh, the diameter of the beam spreads out. Uh, so um, by the time you go out um, about 400 feet, uh, the laser beam width is going to be the same diameter of the pipe. So it's really not going to do you any good. Say a one, one milliradian uh, beam divergence on the laser uh, at 400 um, um or at 4,000 feet, less than a mile, gives you a four inch diameter beam at 4,000 feet. That is, if your alpha, your beam divergence is 10 to the minus third radians, you multiply that times your distance. If your distance is 4,000 um, uh, feet, out at 4,000 feet, the uh, uh, beam width is going to be four feet, one one thousandth of that, so to just get four inches, which is one third of a foot, you're going to have to back up if a thousand feet gives you a one foot diameter. And then uh, less than that, you're going to be at, have to be at 300, um, uh, 400 inches or 4,000 inches. I'm sorry. 4,000 inches would give you a beam um, diameter um, if you're out at you shoot your laser 4,000 inches out, you're going to have a beam diameter of 4 inches. Well, 
4,000 inches is less than 400 feet. So the, the, the laser just isn't going to be any good on anything like this. But the auto level certainly will with uh, an auto level that has a uh, spotting accuracy or angular deviation of 3.3 uh, 3 arc seconds or less is what you would need here. Now, the advantage of this is many fold. The PVC pipe comes either in white or uh, green. You'd get a white PVC pipe so it wouldn't be heating up in the sunlight. It'll reflect most of the sunlight. You could also coat it or wrap it, say, in aluminum foil to get better uh, reflectivity on radiation so the pipe doesn't uh, absorb heat and heat up the uh, air inside. Um, you could do that. Now, once this is all joined, you can eliminate refractive effects because you have a controlled environment inside the pipe. You're not outside uh, like you would be with one of these beam fences or whatever and trying to uh, sight things with a laser. You could very easily control the temperature inside here by maybe having a, um, um, a fan blowing uh, down this tube, you could open up the tube and mount a, uh, a, a fan in here and getting air blown down here to keep the uh, uh, environment uh, stable and constant. Uh, you could mount thermistors, say in every tube or every um, few sections of tube to monitor the temperature. So you can uh, uh, measure the temperature profile going down here, down the... Um, uh, the, 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 the tube um, sections uh, so that you could calculate whether or not there is any refraction. If you could maintain the uh, stable temperature, you could do things to keep the temperatures constant. If the temperature is constant down the length, you don't have any refractive effects to worry about. So you have a controlled environment here that you can deal with. You can keep the temperature constant. And if you needed to, you could get some pipe insulation and wrap the pipe in insulation to keep it even more stable in terms of temperature. So by shooting your auto level down this pipe, you have a very controlled environment uh, to look through and you don't have all the problems of looking through the atmosphere that you would have like with this rail system or any other system or trying to shoot lasers. Um, to establish uh, level lines. Uh, and the other thing is, is cost-wise, like I said, is each section generally runs about $8, but if you're buying in bulk on something like this, it's quite conceivable that you could get a discount of 50% or more on these things where, where you're paying less than a, um, a half a dollar a foot uh, at 80 cents a foot, just going out and buying them piecewise, you, you, you could get the price probably drop down to about uh, um, uh, 3 or $4 for a 10 foot section. So you're looking at 30, 40 cents a foot. Say at 40 cents a foot, you're talking about $2,000 a mile on something like this. And then of course you have issues you have to address the um, mounting system. You're going to have that anyway, no matter what system you're going to use. Um, and of course, that's additional cost. This isn't going to be cheap, but using precision milled steel rails or metal rails, aluminum steel or whatever, would just be astronomical. And this is much more a much more affordable way of going about doing this. Now, as far as where would you uh, have a canal would you have to dig a canal for water in that? Well, I just found out uh, the other day uh, something rather amazing is uh, an individual told me that lives over at the Great Salt Lake that one end of the Salt Lake is very, very shallow, no more than about uh, uh, five, six inches deep for miles. You could do this at the Great Salt Lake if you could get permission. You wouldn't have to dig any canals or anything. Depend. Uh, 
uh, a lot on the stability of the of the lake bed as to how stable you could keep this. Um, but boy, that would be a if if that is indeed the case at the Great Salt Lake where you can wade for miles. Uh, that that would be fantastic for setting something like this up. So anyway, that's my thought. There, you know, give this some more thought. There's probably ways to improve this, uh, but this is kind of the basic layout of what I would propose you do if you wanted to try to set up a so-called force the line experiment.